a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Whoever does not worship my fart is guilty of a deadly sin and hell, for he does not acknowledge that I have the authority to bind and command everything. Whoever does not kiss my feet, and, if I were to bind it so, lick my behind, is guilty of a deadly sin and deep hell, for Christ has given me, the Pope, the keys of authority to bind all and everything. Whatever king, emperor or prince does not hand over to me, his kingdom and authority is guilty of a deadly sin and eternal damnation, for I, the Pope, have the authority to bind and command such things. Whatever bishop does not buy the pallium from me commits a deadly sin and is damned. The reason? I, the Pope, have the power to bind and to command such things. Whoever calls such a purchase, it's not robbery, simony, whoever calls such a purchase simony, is guilty of a deadly and damnable sin, for it is I, the Pope, who should bind and loose. Whoever complains of the burden of enates, papal months, and many more, commits a deadly sin, for I, the Pope, have authority to bind such things. That is what he means in this 19 in memoriam, that one must bear and suffer everything the See of Rome imposes, even if it is unbearable. And the papal month that I've just mentioned refers to the right of the Pope to nominate persons for ecclesiastical offices during certain months of the year. This, quote, right of reservation, unquote, as canon law calls it, had been practiced since the 12th century. So, welcome to a new, the 14th reading of the wonderful book Martin Luther wrote in 1545 against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. I just started without any introduction on page 337 on the top of the page where I left off last time in the reading. And I think it is now time to do a little introduction that you know what this is all about. But because I stopped right in this summation where the Pope says, contrary to Scripture, what he thinks is his right, and that he thinks that he possesses the keys to bind and to lose, and that he thinks that he is the successor of Peter who was built the quote-unquote true church on. That's why I needed to continue this book right away, in this way. So now I welcome you to the 14th reading of Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution of the Devil. And again, we will continue because we are still busy with explaining to you that his holy child, the Pope, the holy child of the devil, has just the same kind of work to do in Christ's kingdom as we referred to last time um, that Satan did in Job's kingdom. And we shall, now, uh, we shall now illustrate with some examples. And I was then stopping in the middle of these examples because the video was otherwise going too long. And now we are going to continue here. And now Martin Luther's, Luther writes the following. And so that I return to the real points... Christ wanted marriage to be free. That's biblical. That is Martin Luther speaking. No, says the farter in Rome, priests, monks and nuns, 
should not be married, and it is much better to live chastely, according to the Roman papal cardinal chastity, compared with which Sodom and Gomorrah were virgins, than to get married. The essence? Priests, monks and nuns should not be married, and it is much better to live chastely than to get married. Again, laymen should not get married or have wedding during the closed seasons, for the hellish father has closed and forbidden it on pain of deadly sin and damnation. After this, he scrapped all the sects of monks and nuns together, with all their statutes on clothes, food, gestures, etc. And whatever a fool like this invented, confirmed the, these countless and unbearable laws, and crowned them with indulgences and grace, so that Christian freedom and faith were no longer known. Instead, the whole world, all the corners, all the clothing, all the people, all the foods, have been overwhelmed and filled with strings and bonds, so that, had it gone on any longer, it might have had to be sin and hell if someone had coughed, blown his nose, sneezed, or otherwise relieved his need. I, Luther, won't mention now, that he has instituted with his false indulgences, jubilee, holy water, agnus dei, holy oil, fire, wax, herbs, oh, what can recount, who can recount it all, and pilgrimages, brotherhoods. There is almost no creature left around who, uh, 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 there is almost no creature left around whom he has not hung his snares and poisoned, so that whenever someone walked, stood, or did anything, he came into danger of sin and death. But he did not do all these things to establish discipline and good government in the church, as are done by, by the office of preacher, the father of the family, and the temporal sword. For discipline has no need for use for such fine bonds and snares. Instead, all of this must bear a noble title, so that it defames, blasphemes, and desecrates God. Namely, it must be called service to God and holy good works, through which forgiveness of sins and eternal life may be achieved. See, that is, this is the big problem that Martin Luther has with the papacy and with the Roman Catholic Church, and that I do have with the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church and with the Antichrist too that they are absolutely unbiblical, and saying that the God of this world, Satan, in the person of the Antichrist, of the Pope, calls to good works, holy good works, through which forgiveness of sins and eternal life may be achieved. In the Roman Catholic Church you never are sure of your salvation. You always have to do more. You have to do more works, give more money, do more penance. Whereas, when you are a Bible-believing Christian, you understand that when you are saved, when you are chosen by God, when you are elected by God, when the Father draws you to His Son, and you accept His Son and the sacrifice He did once and for all for us, you are saved you have the assurance of eternal life. Through grace you are saved, and that not through your works, lest that any man should boast. Right? That's what the Bible says. But the Pope, of course, says otherwise. Now Martin Luther continues, This is to say that herewith Christians are forced to believe that the Pope has the authority and power as a god over the churches, to bind and do whatever he wants. Indeed, he has thus strengthened his own power and subjected us to obedience to himself. Obedience to himself, to the Pope, to a man, not to our Father in heaven. He has robbed the whole world of its money and goods to do so, and afterward, 
quite softly and joyfully laughed up his sleeve. <laughs> so that the Christians are such great crude fools as to let themselves be fooled and deceived so easily out of their faith, liberty, body and soul, goods and honor, temporally and eternally. That was the devil's chief aim for, as was said, the worst damage is not that he has subjected our bodies, goods and honor to himself with his accursed bonds, but that he has bound and tied up the consciences, our souls with them, as though they were divine ordinances, service to God and works to attain salvation, and makes sin where there is none. That is, when consciences became frightened and timid, faith weakened and finally strangled and suffocated, and Christian freedom was lost. Martin Luther sees this already in the year 1545. How about today? We only have to remember that the Bible clearly says, Don't fear him who can kill the body on earth, but fear him who can kill the body and the soul in hell, which is our Father in heaven. Huh? But the Antichrist succeeds, because that was the devil's chief aim, that he has subjected our bodies, our goods and honor to himself with accursed bonds, but he has bound and tied up the consciences or souls with him. He binds our souls to him. And when your soul is bound to Satan, your soul is not bound to God the Father. And when your soul is bound to Satan, then it is him who you serve, knowingly or unknowingly, willingly or unwillingly. It is he who you worship, he you obey, the one that you pay obedience to. Right? So make sure that you don't get in the snares of the Antichrist, that you don't get in the snares of the devil. Martin Luther continues, Thus was filled what uh, St. Paul said in Second uh, Colossians uh, chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, quote, Why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? <laughs> There are those who say, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Unquote. Why do you submit to regulations made by man? Why do you live as if you still belonged to the world? Why are you running after every little treat the devil throws at you in this world, like elections and political discussions? Why are you getting ensnared in the left-right paradigm? Why do you think that patriotism for your worldly country is a good thing, when you are actually serving the Antichrist in any country of this world? Patriotism is one of the biggest weapons the, uh, the, uh, the god of this world, Satan, has. It's one of the deadliest weapons of them all. Patriotism. I pay allegiance to my country. And then you see politicians do the same thing, taking oath and saying, I swear to protect, for example, the United States of America from enemies within and enemies without. And you don't understand that they are Roman Catholics who have only one kingdom that they adhere to, and that is Rome. A Roman Catholic, and even worse, a Jesuit, is never a patriot to the country that he serves in, but always a patriot for Rome. Mental reservation allows him to take these oaths and to do so. So why do you live as if you still belong to the world? You have to detach yourself from this world. Be ye separate, the Bible says. Be ye separate from the unholy. Don't mix the holy with the profane. Don't mix the holy with the unholy. 
do not belong anymore to this world. Do not submit to regulations in this world. Of course, obey the civil law, as long as the civil law does not conflict with the law of God. These are the strong errors which God sends to those who do not love the truth, but believe the lie, as we can read in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11. And if the devil himself were to rule in Rome, he could not make it any worse anyway. Indeed, if he himself ruled, we could cross ourselves before him and flee so that he could accomplish nothing. Now that the Pope has given himself to him, embellished himself with the mask of God's word, under which one was unable to recognize him, it is the wrath of God that everything is bitter, devilish, hellish hatred of Christ and his church could think of has happened. So he has become our God. Satan has become our God, whom we have worshipped under the name of Saint Peter and Christ, with all his lies, blasphemies and idolatries. This can truly be called being bound and using the keys for power, not for faith. Here you may read Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 yourself, and see what Saint Paul means when he says, quote, the Antichrist sits in the very temple of God, that is, in Christ's church, as though he were God and Christ himself, as his hypocrites blaspheme, saying that the Pope is not purely man, but a mixture of God and man, just as our Christ alone is. And you can easily gather from the previous items what a man of sin is uh, sorry, and you can easily gather from the previous items what a man of sin is, who is not only a sinner by himself, but fills the whole world, particularly God's temple, the church, full, full, full of sin, false service to God, blasphemy, unbelief and lies, thus also being a child of perdition, that is, taking himself and countless souls to hell and eternal damnation. And that is the goal of Satan from the beginning. When you worship him, your soul belongs to him and he takes your soul into perdition, into eternal damnation. Your soul is lost for eternal life with your Father in heaven. That is the goal from the devil from in the beginning. He wants adoration. He wants obedience. He wants worship. Read Isaiah 14. And then you get it. That is the goal. And everybody who adores, worships and obeys the Antichrist and Satan will be lost. His soul will be lost. You will also become a child of perdition. That is, you will be taken together with countless other souls to hell and thereby to eternal damnation instead of eternal life and peace and truth. We have to understand this once and for all. The temple of God where the Pope sits in is the congregation of the Church of Christ here on this earth. The congregation or the Church of Christ here are the true believers. The Pope came out of these true believers and set himself in the temple because we are all stones building this temple on earth. And the Pope set himself on the throne and exalted himself above all that is God, as it is predicted in the Bible. Exalt himself above everything that is called God, exactly as Satan wanted in Isaiah 14. Do you see the similarities? Do you see where things are matching up? Together, everything that Satan said in Isaiah 14, the Pope says, all through his life. And I don't mean one Pope, I mean the office of the papacy. I mean all the Popes, from the first to the current until the very last. Yeah? It's all the same. This last sentence, I'm going to read it again. 
and you can easily gather from the previous items what a man of sin is who is not only a sinner by himself, but fills the whole world, particularly God's temple, God's holy people. The church, the bride of Jesus Christ on earth, full, full of sin, full of false service to God, full of blasphemy, full of unbelief and full of lies, thus also being a child of perdition, that is, taking himself and countless souls to hell and eternal damnation. The Turk, Martin Luther continues, means Islam, leads the world astray too, but he does not sit in the temple of God, nor does he use the names of Christ, Saint Peter or Holy Scripture. Instead, the Turk attacks Christendom from the outside and boasts of being its enemy. Now, if you needed any more proof that the Antichrist cannot be Islam, then I cannot help you. This was just a sentence that Martin Luther wrote almost 500 years ago that makes absolutely certain why Islam can never be the Antichrist. Because Islam leads the world astray too, and surely in the time that we are living in today, in 2017, by the way, we have today the 25th of November 2017, when I read this, a Sabbath, the Turk leads the world astray too, with ISIS and all these refugee situations all over the world right now. But the Turk, or Islam, does not sit in the temple of God. He is not within the Church of Christ on earth. Nor does he use the names of Christ, St. Peter or Holy Scripture. Instead, he attacks Christendom from the outside and boasts of being its enemy, whereas the real Antichrist gives you the idea that he is the brother of Christ, that he is a child of Jesus Christ, that he is in obedience to Jesus Christ, that he is even the representative of Jesus Christ here on this earth. That's the big problem. Uh, when you understand scripture, you will know that Antichrist does not only mean against, but also means in the place of. Now, where is Islam in the place of Jesus Christ on this earth? Do you know an example? I know not. And I don't think there is one. Because Islam is not the Antichrist. So, Martin Luther makes it very sure in this one little sentence on the bottom of page 339 that Islam, which he calls the Turk, that was due to that time when Martin Luther lived in, that Islam cannot be the Antichrist. He says it with a 100% conviction, and I repeat it with the same conviction. The Turk leads the world astray too, because the Turk, Islam, is one of the weapons of the Antichrist, is one of the weapons of the real son of perdition, of the man of sin, of the little horn in Rome. He leads the world astray too by his lies and Sharia law and all that stuff, and his fake Quran, quote-unquote, holy book, as they want to have it. But the Islam does not sit in the temple of God, nor does Islam use the names of Christ, or St. Peter, or even the Holy Scripture. Instead, he attacks Christendom from the outside and boasts of being its enemy. Everybody in this world knows that Islam is an enemy of Christendom. And I don't mean with Christendom Catholics, I mean real Christendom, I mean Bible-believing Christians. Everybody knows that. He is an open foe, an open enemy. The Antichrist of Scripture is a wolf in sheep's clothing, someone who pretends to be a friend, an ally, and devours the flock from within. But Martin Luther continues, his inward destroyer claims to be a friend, wants to be called father, and is twice as bad as the Turk. 
That is called the quote-unquote desolating sacrilege in Matthew 24.15 or destruction. An idol who in opposition to Christ makes a shambles of everything Christ built and has given us. Oh, how terrible it is to watch and hear such horror! This shall be said briefly on the second damage wrought by the Pope's binding murder of souls, idolatry, lies and the destruction of faith, the imprisoning of Christian freedom and the corruption of conscience. Now when the devil had established himself in such immeasurable power and occupied himself with nothing but binding, capturing, lying, robbing, murdering and blaspheming, as his works are, as we can read in John 8, verse 44, he began the second part, namely, losing, not forgiving sin, but offering these fine laws for sale and selling them. Simony! Coming from Simon Magus, who wanted to buy the power of the Holy Spirit with money from the apostles. That's where simony comes from. That's why the Roman Catholic Church is built on simony, buying these fine laws and sale them uh, and, and, and selling them. For he has also the power to lose, as Lisi claims, that is, to sell for money, so he has set up a market and business in the whole world, which, I am sure, he would not exchange for the market in Venice or Antwerp. Thus, he offers for sale butter letters, Butterbriefe, I was speaking about those earlier, whether it was in this book reading or it was in, uh, in, in something else. But Butterbriefe are the kind of indulgence that you could buy so that you could eat butter and eggs and milk produce on a Friday when the Roman Catholic Church actually forbade it. But then you could buy indulgences in the form of butter letters, Butterbriefe. Thus he offers for sale butter letters, egg letters, milk letters, cheese letters, meat letters, letters of indulgences, mass letters and marriage letters. And do you know what just shoots into my mind? The VAT that we pay on all the stuff that I just mentioned here is exactly these indulgences today. Because it is a sum of money that you have to pay above the worth of those products and that goes directly to the governing body, right? What are taxes else than robbery? Yeah? So when we take all these butter letters, egg letters, milk letters, cheese letters, meat letters, letters of indulgences, mass letters and marriage letters. What are these but the modern taxes that we pay on all the produce? And everything he has bound abominably, he now loses more abominably for money. There you have the swarm and vermin of his business indulgences, privileges, immunities without measure and number. Thus, his laws are not only snares for the soul and bonds for the poor consciences, as was said, for which he has rubbed and stolen all the money and goods, but they are also fish lines and nets for money, so that he may rob and steal whatever is left over. Now we have to buy, with our money, our Christian freedom earned for us by Christ's blood and given in grace, as Lamentations verse, uh, chapter 5 verses 2 through 4 also complains. And yet, we could never be certain whether we were doing the right thing, for there was no faith that could have given us any assurance. The Pope does not care about that, just as long as he gets his money and confirms his power. What should the Pope and his God, the devil, care about the welfare of souls? That's a good question, huh? Eh? That brings me back to part 9, that was titled, What are God, Christ, Church, World and Lawyers to the Pope? What should the Pope and his God, the devil, care about the welfare of souls? <laughs> this is in comparison almost the same thing that is stated here, right? And um, we really should understand that. It says here, the Pope does not care about that, just as long as he gets his money and confirms his power. What should the Pope 
And does God the devil care about the welfare of souls? They don't want the welfare of souls. They just want the souls lost for the God of the Bible. They want them for themselves. I, who have seen much, was in this myself, Martin Luther says. I guess there are probably still many in the papacy who would not have built upon this selling and losing of the popes, even though they had made a large fortune. And often it was a greater sin and a deeper hell if someone ate meat on Friday than if he had committed murder or even adultery. But if a monk had not bought his tonsure, cap and monkhood, as often happened from the Pope, he was considered an apostate, backsliding Christian, whose soul was hopeless. Thus, human teaching is a desperate, deep, devilish poison when it really grasps the conscience, especially when long habit and God's name are falsely added, so that God's commandment falls by the wayside in comparison with these iron chains of human devilish teachings. Very well, this is indeed called masterfully interpreting the words of Christ. Quote, Whatever you bind and loose on earth shall be bound and loosed in heaven. Unquote. Friend, draw me the ass pope with his bagpipes here. Let us also thank God who has delivered us from such bonds of the devil so that nothing worse happens to us. The first damage in the church wrought by the Pope with his first with his keys it sorry. The first damage what am I reading here? The first damage in the church wrought by the Pope with his keys is first. He should bind, ban and punish the real sin against God's commandment, which is the only reason the Lord gave the keys to his church Matthew chapter sixteen and eighteen. The Pope has no binding keys here, but only losing keys, since he lets such free living go on in Rome and all the monasteries, and all kinds of outrages and whoring that even Sodom is holy compared with them. And he himself is the abbot of such a holy order, the worst rascal of all the rascals on earth, the dreadful fear of just uh, of a just free council comes from this, for he wishes to be unreformed and will probably remain so in all eternity. Bang! Here Martin Luther says it with his own words. There is no reformation possible. The dreadful fear of a just free council comes from this, for he wishes to be unreformed and will probably remain unreformed in all eternity. There will not be a reformation of the Roman Catholic Church. The reformation was a reformation of the people back to the real Bible apostolic belief. Okay? Back to the scripture. Sola Scriptura. That kind of a reformation was there. And for the rest it was no reformation. It was a the birth of the protest, of protesting the Antichrist, because all of a sudden, when the people held the book of Daniel, the book of Second Thessalonians, and the book of Revelation in their hands, they could see the prophetic words of the prophets and of Jesus Christ himself in Revelation about the whore of Babylon. They could make out for themselves who the Antichrist is. And with that it is absolutely impossible to have any kind of reformation. The Pope wishes to be unreformed and will remain so in all eternally. I just scrapped the word probably, because that can be scrapped. Because Rome never changes. Semperiadem, that is their motto. The Pope will not tolerate the keys above him. Rather, he wants them under him. As he rants in many decretals, no one should or would bind or judge him. Well, it, why do you think, when you take the Vatican flag, the papal flag, that the tiara, the triple crown, is above the keys? 
because the mind of the Pope is above the keys that bind and loose. That is the way that you find it here in this world, in, even in his flag. He will not tolerate the keys above him, rather he wants them under him. So that's like they are in the Vatican flag. As he rants in many decretals, no one should or would bind or judge him. The Pope says that he is the judge of every man, but not to be judged by any man. That is Roman Catholic dogma. When you are a Roman Catholic, you have to submit to this teaching, to this dogma. You cannot judge the Pope. Nobody can judge the Pope. No man. But he, on the other hand, he can judge everyone. So it is impossible to hold a useful, fruitful council. For he will afterward carry on as before and will loosen himself from the council as he has always done and as he freely claims to have the power to do henceforth. Now, I think it is not very interesting to go into that for a long time, but I just want to mention that for a, for a moment here, that Martin Luther died in the beginning of the Council of Trent, that took on for 18 years, between 1545 and 1563. Of course, it was interrupted a few times, even for a few years, but altogether it ran over 18 years. And Martin Luther died in the beginning of that. I don't think that Martin Luther would be even possible to be participating in that Council of Trent at that time, because he was still excommunicated. Uh, they would have killed him. They would have flayed him. They would have torn him apart in pieces. But I think, and that is the conclusion that I have come to, that the reason Martin Luther died at that age... He was only 63 in, 19, uh, in, in 1546 when he died. Um, that he died then because he would have been probably a danger with other books that he could write about the subject during the Council of Trent. Or even uh, after the time of the Council of Trent. You know? But even during the time, I think, and that is my personal conviction, the Roman Catholic Church, and especially the new founded Jesuit order, wanted Martin Luther buried six feet under, so that he could not interfere with the Council of Trent. And as you can read here, as I've just read to you, Martin Luther says here, so it is impossible to hold a useful, fruitful council. Martin Luther says that in the beginning, because this book was published the same day the Council of Trent was opened. And he says, it is impossible to hold a useful, fruitful council, for the Pope will afterward carry on as before, and the Pope will loosen himself from the council, as the Pope has always done, and he, the Pope, freely claims to have the power to do so henceforth. This is a conviction of Martin Luther, based on biblical prophecy, and absolutely correct, but a great danger for the new founded order of the Jesuits and for the Roman Catholic Church, who has, had, who has taken hit after hit after hit after the time of Martin Luther in 1517, nailing the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. Yeah? Again and again and again, the church lost the wound, was afflicted of Revelation 13. And it was almost becoming a deadly wound. And one of the nails to the coffin of that dead body would have been Martin Luther living through the Council of Trent and probably publishing books, pamphlets, documents, essays, whatever kind of writings against this council. That would have probably made the council of none effect. And therefore... In my personal opinion, they needed Martin Luther to die before the Council of Trent even started. Oh, why do we plague ourselves with the accursed Pope? How can he bind sins? The crude, crass ass and fool does not even understand what sin is, and is not able to, and does not wish to know. I know that our children or catechumens, that is, 
those who know their catechism are more learned than Pope, are even more learned than cardinals and the whole curia with its followers. You need not worry that the papal ass with his Roman school of scoundrels understands one single commandment out of the ten, one petition in the Lord's Prayer, one article of faith, or how baptism and the sacrament are to be understood and used, how a Christian should live, what good works are. God grant that he could recite, I won't speak of understanding, but recite the Ten Commandments one after the other. As our children of four or five years old even can. For they do not read, for they do not read them and do not occupy themselves with them, so they do not include them in their large books, decrees, decretals, sexti clementi, extravagantes, or bulls. Uh, we are speaking here about the sextus decretalium liber, uh, the clementinae. And the extravagantes comprised that part of canon law which was collected in the 13th and 14th century. They are, together with the decreti prima parts, which we have already cited earlier in this book, called the corpus iuros canonici, meaning the body of the Catholic canon law. Okay? They do not include them in their large books, decrees, decretal sexti, clementinae, extravagantes, or even papal bulls. You cannot find one word in all these books, including their writings, which would teach you to understand the first commandment or to pray one petition of the Lord's Prayer. And it is no wonder they consider that uh, they consider what we Christians believe fraud and sheer foolishness. They call us simple Christians, or bon Christian, as we read already a few pages before. That is, great fools who would believe such things. For just think, if he should understand the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. And, on the other hand, what to call sin he would then have to burn all his decrees, decretals and bulls, and along with them himself and all his cardinals. As heard above, his decretals are sheer supreme lies, fearful blasphemies and horrible idolatries. How could he not have other gods? He who originates idolatry, blasphemy and lies in the whole world as a man of sin and child of perdition must that is why there is nothing here about keys, about binding, banning and, per uh, and punishing sin. For there is no one here who would know or recognize what sin even is. Because when you do not know the law, you do not know that the transgression of law is sin. And the Pope makes up his own laws as he walks along. One must let him go and he is possessed and always turns toward the devil. God's wrath has come down upon them, and they sin impenitently against the Holy Spirit. And the sin against the Holy Spirit, like blaspheming the Holy Spirit, is a sin that is not forgiven in this life and not forgiven in the next life. And that's what the Pope does. When the Pope calls himself the Vicar of Christ, a title that belongs to the Holy Spirit, and he usurps the title from the Holy Spirit, he blasphemes the Holy Spirit. And blaspheming the Holy Spirit is a sin that is not to be forgiven. That's what the Bible says. But of course the Pope does not know the Bible, so therefore he does not care what is in it. Second, now that he has come to the losing of the real sin, that is, to the forgiveness of sin committed against God's command, he makes the consoling losing key worthless and powerless in the whole world. He and his school teach that this key does not lose, and sins are not forgiven where repentance, confession and atonement are not present. Thus he points us away from faith to our works, so that we can never again be certain beforehand that we are worthy of forgiveness and have earned it. 
This is a vain and impossible thing. Oh, it is a terrible plague in Christendom to make people uncertain and leave them to their own uncertain works. Bang! Exactly, this is confirmation of what I said in the beginning of this video. A real Bible-believing Jesus Christ following Christian knows that he is saved because grace and righteousness is imputed to us through Jesus Christ, through grace, through faith, through faith, which is a gift of God. And when we accept it, we are saved. In the Roman Catholic Church, Martin Luther says, it is a terrible plague in quote-unquote Christendom, in Roman Catholicism, I would rather say, to make a clear distinction to make people uncertain and leave them to their own uncertain works. Meaning, the Roman Catholic Church teaches you have to work for your salvation. Your salvation depends on your own works. Exactly that what God says, no. You have nothing to do with your salvation. You have nothing to do with righteousness being imputed to you. It is a gift of God. You only have to accept it. But the Roman Catholic Church teaches otherwise. She teaches 180 degrees opposite of what the Bible teaches. It's a terrible plague in Roman Catholicism to make people uncertain and leave them to their own uncertain works. Our dear Lord and Saviour with the words, Whatever you lose shall be loosed, gives us a particularly comforting promise, as was said above, that what we lose will be loosed with him, as is more clearly written in John chapter 20 verse 23, quote, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven, unquote. These are words, I say, of promise, with which he promises forgiveness of sins. Such a promise does not demand our works, as the law does, but our faith. God does not want to give us the kingdom of heaven for the sake of our merit, but out of sheer grace and mercy, mercy through Jesus Christ. And it should not mean, as they teach, that repentance should be so great that one could rise from it the mouth of heaven, uh, the mouth to heaven. Yes, like Judas with the rope on the tree in Matthew 27, 5, and Saul on his own sword in 2 Samuel 1, 10. But the papal ass also knows nothing about faith, promises, or God's commandments. He regards the church as an ass's stable or pigsty whether he can reign with his filth. There's a little footnote here when I was reading to you, and it should not mean that repentance should be so great that one should rise from the mouth to heaven. And that footnote reads that this is a reference to the medieval teaching that the immortal soul <laughs> leaves through the mouth when it rises to heaven. Okay? There is no immortal soul, and it doesn't leave through the mouth to heaven. There is a video uh, a, a week or two or three ago I saw from uh, Chick Publications, and uh, I made a comment on that, and of course I was attacked by many people because that was a picture that he showed there about a dying old woman where you can see her quote-unquote soul coming out of her body and then being accepted by Jesus Christ and uh, he lauded that picture as a good one and I said well this picture is absolutely wrong teaching because it teaches the immortal soul there is no immortal soul you know when you understand the Bible and I'm gonna take it right here with me the King James of course and we go to the book of Genesis and we go into chapter 2. Um, what do we read there? When God makes man, uh, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Uh, 
King James Version, book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7. Listen again. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We are not given a soul, we become a soul in the moment that the breath of life enters our bodies. Okay? That is when we are born. Some need a clap on the behind before they breathe for the first time and cry out. Some start right away. But that is the moment when we start breathing, when we become a living soul. I'm not saying that we are dead while we are in the wound of our mother that we breathe in another way, but when here we are out here, we are through our nostrils and through our mouth breathe the breath of life and we become a living soul. That's at least how it is written here in the Bible with the first man, with Adam. We become a living soul. When we die, we do our last breath, right? So then we are no longer a soul, right? Because the soul can only live with the breath of life. And when we are dead, we don't have the breath of life in us anymore. So then we can only wait for the restoration, for the resurrection of life in us. That is when we get another breath of life. That is with the resurrection. There is no immortal soul. That is wrong Roman Catholic diabolic teaching. Yeah? So when here in the footnote we read a reference to the medieval teaching that the immortal soul leaves through the mouth when it rises to heaven, yeah? it is a medieval teaching and it also is a satanic teaching. There is no immortal soul and that doesn't leave through the mouth or the nostrils or whatever. We just do our last breath. Wherever then the soul goes, it's none, of our, it's none of our business. The Bible says in another place, man knows that he has to die and the, death, and the dead know nothing. Right? This is what we have to believe. Yeah? The immortal soul leaves through the mouth. No, 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 no. That is devilish. That is satanic teaching. So... When we read here, and it should not mean, as they teach, that repentance should be so great that one could rise from the mouth to heaven, meaning that his, quote-unquote, immortal soul can leave to heaven. Yes, like Judas with the rope on the tree and soul on his own sword. But the papal ass also knows nothing, nothing about faith. He knows nothing about promises or God's commandments. He regards the church as an ass's stable for pigsty, where he can reign with his filth. That is enough about this passage in Matthew 16. I have written too much and too at, 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 I have written too much and at too great length, but the popish horror has no limits or end. And where you see, I think, how well the Pope can interpret Christ's words, and how well he has based his papacy on them, this means, as Christ said, quote, by your words and you will be condemned. By your words you will be condemned, as you can read in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse 37, and as in 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, quote, he catches the wise in their craftiness, unquote. The Holy Spirit is an expert at taking the very same words used by the raving spirits for their own purpose and using them against them, toppling them with their own weapons. I could not, on the spot, think of a more powerful passage in Scripture to use against the Pope, as already shown, than just the one with which he wants to base, set, build and defend himself and with which he is so quickly trapped and caught through his own craftiness. In German, it is called pelting oneself with one's own wisdom. In German it says, in seiner Klugheit sich beschmeißen. The Pope lies in his own filth, and thus one finds out that his rule and rank come neither from God nor man, 
but from all the devils in hell, sheer idolatry, blasphemy, lies, murder of souls, murder, robbery, disorder and enmity against God, emperor, king and all men, especially against Christendom, all far worse than the Turk or Islam. Well, you say, he doesn't care about your screaming and writing. He remains safe from you. He is too powerful. <laughs> I am quite satisfied with that. It is enough for me that I myself am safe, and that I know how to judge him according to God's word, which speaks against him, that I can with good conscience consider him a fart ass and an enemy of God. He cannot consider me an ass, for he knows that I, by God's special grace, am more learned in the scriptures than he and all his asses are, not only I, but a great many more of his people in almost every country. He has the devil on his side, but we have God's word. Let it come to the point of open warfare. If we die, then we shall live in that much greater glory with Christ. If he survives, then he will die that much more horrible with all the devils. Quia Emmanuel, here God is with us. There the devil is with him. Happy is he who will have the final victory. The second saying, which is supposed to prove that the Pope has come from God, is in the last chapter of John, chapter 21, verse 15, quote, Feed my lambs. Here, an Antichrist Pope Clements III, extra de elect significasti, is this gloss, quote, Christ's sheep are entrusted to us in St. Peter, since our Lord says, feed my lambs, and makes no distinction between these sheep and those sheep, so that everyone should know that he does not belong to his sheepfold if he does not acknowledge Peter and the heirs to his see and his shepherd and master, unquote, etc. I was frightened, and thought I was dreaming. It was such a thunderclap, such a great horrid fart, did the papal ass let go here. He certainly pressed with great might to let out such a thunderous fart. It's a wonder that it did not tear his hole and belly apart. If I were to ask here, but what did all the other apostles, especially St. Paul Pasture, Perhaps the big fart of the papal ass will say that maybe they pastured rats, mice and lice, or, if it went well, sows, sows, just so that the papal ass remains the shepherd and all apostles' swineherds. We have come to a nice little place that is interesting for me to stop the reading because we have already done about 57 and a half, almost 58 minutes in the reading. And when I go any further, that will ask too much of explanation. And it was anyway quite intensive, the reading here. So I will stop here now on the top of page 345, where we go into the next analysis, next to where we have had already uh, Matthew 16 and 18. Now the Pope also claims... John Ultimo, meaning the last chapter of John, 21, verse 15, feed my lambs, so that he is uh, the that that he is uh, to prove that his power comes from God. He uses now John 21 and 15, and we will go into that in the next, in the 15th reading of the wonderful book of Martin Luther, Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution of the Devil, published in 1545, almost 500 years ago. Thank you very much for watching, listening and commenting, and until next time, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye bye.
false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaks lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaks lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of shall not be unpunished and he that speak his lies shall not escape a false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speak his lies shall not escape